Hi, I'm Joel Richardson, and this is The Underground. Welcome to this week's episode of The Underground, a program that explores the testimony of the biblical prophets, the gospel of Jesus Christ, current events, and how all of these things relate to you and me. Now, in this week's episode, I want to go ahead and begin dealing with a prophecy that has uh, gained a lot of attention over the past couple years. Uh, Many students of prophecy, many teachers of prophecy have been talking about this particular prophecy, and I haven't uh, done a show on it. I've had many people ask me to do a show on it. And so I want to, as usual, just sort of begin to touch on this prophecy, but I want to zero in on the oracle of Isaiah 17. So this is the oracle against Damascus. Now, If you've been following, uh, let's just say, the prophecy blogosphere, if you've been tracking with a lot of the different articles that have come out since all that's been unfolding in the nation of Syria, many, uh, again, teachers and students of prophecy have been saying, could it be possible, could it be possible that the prophecy, the oracle of Isaiah 17 is about to be fulfilled? So we're going to go ahead and look at that, but essentially... Isaiah 17 is an oracle given by Isaiah against Damascus, and what it speaks of is the destruction of Damascus never to be inhabited again. And so, of course, with all that's unfolding right now, and and really Damascus in so many ways is, uh, it's certainly not destroyed, but much of it is in rubble. I mean, large sections of it are just absolute ruinous uh, I mean, it looks like something after World War II in Europe. You know, it's it's been devastated. The whole nation of Syria is devastated. This was a beautiful, beautiful gem of the Middle East. I've always wanted to visit Syria. So many historical sites, biblical sites, and uh, it's it's going to be if, I mean, if the war ended right now, which it's not going to, we would be dealing with generations before Syria is restored. So it, it's an absolute catastrophe just on a historical, archaeological level. But in terms of the humanitarian crisis, of course, uh, that absolutely surpasses any of these things. So there's a the tremendous tragedy. But uh, as is usual with regard to biblical prophecy, students of prophecy, uh, you know, we unfortunately sometimes, especially those of us over here in the United States, those of us that are removed from the Middle East, sometimes we approach biblical prophecy like it's a movie or like it's a chess game. And so we sit back in the comfort uh, of the United States, you know, being significantly out of range for the most part. And we analyze these things, we analyze these nations, these prophecies, like they're an unfolding story. And uh, it, I, I just always like to remind everyone that these prophecies, these oracles throughout the scriptures, they concern very real nations, they concern very real people. And so we always need to be cautious of just looking at these things in a callous, detached manner. You know, I've sat down with a pastor from Damascus, an evangelical pastor, and I've met his wife and his beautiful children. And, you know, we interviewed them concerning all that was unfolding with Assad and with Jabhat al-Nusra and ISIS and all of these things and how it was affecting the Christians in Damascus, and it's impossible not to walk away from a meeting like that. Uh, It's impossible to walk away from a meeting like that without being affected emotionally. And so I just, this is just sort of a qualifier and a caution that I want to express over this whole teaching. We're dealing with very real people. We're dealing with families. We're dealing with Muslims. We're dealing with Christians, with Druze, with all sorts of different peoples. And so we need to realize that this is a very sober topic that we're addressing. 
But to the issue, to the matter, could this be something that is about to be fulfilled? This is the question that a lot of people are asking. I want to go ahead and just begin by reading a few statements. I've got three different uh, prophecy teachers or commentators that I've pulled quotes from, just so... because maybe some of you watching this, you go, well, I, I really haven't heard anyone discuss this. Again, if, you're, if you don't track with sort of the whole prophecy world, um, then maybe you've not heard any of this discussion. But this is definitely huge. So I want to read three of these quotes uh, just to contextualize all that we are about to plunge into and discuss. So the first one. Uh, and, and again, I'm not going to mention the names because I, I don't want it to sound as though I'm, uh, I'm, I'm disagreeing with, with these voices and I don't want to make it sound like I'm contending with or picking on them because that's certainly not the case. So this first statement, let me just go ahead and begin here. It says, with the Middle East in constant turmoil and tensions rising daily, it would be sound advice that we all remain watchmen on the wall as it appears, and here's the the kicker, that this prophecy concerning Damascus could come to be fulfilled soon. And that's the main point here. However, as this uh, writer goes on to say, only time will tell for sure when the prophecy will be fulfilled. Would it be smart? We would be smart to keep watching the Middle East as we head towards the end of the age. The Bible says that when the end time signs come into view to lift up your heads for your redemption draws near. And of course, I agree with the sentiment that as the as the landscape, as described by the prophets, begins to come into focus, which I fully agree that it is, we are to lift up our heads, we are to pay attention. However, this matter of whether or not this prophecy is, as this writer says, about to be fulfilled soon. Will it come to be fulfilled soon? This is the issue. This is the matter that we want to dial in on. Another statement here by another, again, very well-known prophecy teacher. Uh, This is a guy, you know, I've met. I really like him. Um, I just simply disagree with uh, the sentiment, again, being expressed here. So he says... The ancient Hebrew prophecy contained in Isaiah 17 is presently poised to find final fulfillment. That's a huge statement. Isaiah 17 is presently poised. It is set up right now to find its final fulfillment, and it could easily be provoked by a poorly calculated political move by America. And he goes on to say, it is reasonable to presume that we are living in the days of Isaiah 17 and Psalm 83. And that a single U.S. missile landing anywhere in Syria could provoke the mother of all Middle East wars. That is predicted in the scriptures. Again, so a fairly uh, dogmatic statement. It would be responsible, it would be reasonable to presume that at any moment this giant war is about to break out. And what you'll often hear a lot of these guys say, because everybody sort of has their different rundown of how it's going to unfold based on their particular understanding of some of these key texts. What a lot of these guys are saying is that what will probably happen is that Damascus will get nuked. Damascus will literally get hit with some sort of a major uh, bomb. It'll level the city, wipe it out. It will be destroyed, and then that will set off the Psalm 83 war, which is this regional Arab Middle Eastern war, and they will invade Israel and then ultimately be defeated, and Israel will conquer much of the Middle East. We're not getting into the whole Psalm 83 thing, but just to understand that they often express that they believe that the destruction of Damascus will be the key event that will set off and initiate all of these other prophecies. So the third uh, quote here, again from another guy that I really like, I love, you know, very just humble guy with a tremendous amount of knowledge of the Middle East and and someone that, you know, everyone loves. Uh, But again, I just disagree with uh, the sentiment here. He says, these prophecies have not yet been fulfilled. Now, I partially agree with that. I, I agree that Isaiah 17 has not found its ultimate fulfillment. So to be clear, I agree with that statement. Then he goes on, he says, Damascus is one of the oldest continuously inhabited cities on earth. It has been attacked, besieged, and conquered. Again, all true. But Damascus has never been completely destroyed and left uninhabited. And we're going to uh, deal with that statement a little bit more as we move on. Does the prophecy actually say 
that Damascus will be completely uninhabited. On one hand, yes, but on the other hand, it actually doesn't. And so this is why we need to actually look at the text. And then he goes on, he says, Yet that is exactly what the Bible says will happen. The context of Isaiah 17 and Jeremiah 49. So this writer brings in another prophecy beyond Isaiah 17, which is Jeremiah 49. We're going to touch on that, but we want to focus, at least on this program, on Isaiah 17. He says they are a series of end-time prophecies dealing with God's judgments on Israel's neighbors and enemies leading up to and through the tribulation. This is the key, is this author is saying that Isaiah 17 is a prophecy which leads up to the tribulation and actually is carried through the tribulation. And, you know, I would agree that it takes place during the tribulation. I would argue, however, that it is something that is ultimately fulfilled at the end of the tribulation, at the end of the tribulation, at the end of the final seven years before the return of Jesus. And so let's go ahead and just um, jump right into the text. So Isaiah 17, now just to give it a little bit of context, and this is what a lot of students of prophecy do, and this is a, this is an, it's a huge mistake, but it's a very common mistake, is we read a particular verse, we lift it out of context, we just read that, and we don't read the larger context of where this particular passage finds itself. And this is essential that we do that. So before we actually begin to read Isaiah 17, we have to stop and say that Isaiah 17 is an oracle. It's a prophecy against Damascus, yes, but it finds itself right I mean, smack dab in the middle of a series of oracles that Isaiah was given. And so this particular portion of the prophecy of Isaiah begins with Isaiah 13 all the way up until Isaiah 23. And it is a series of oracles against Israel's neighbors as well as against Israel. And this is critical. You know, the Lord, uh, his heart is turned toward all the peoples of the world. Now, he has chosen Israel, and he will judge the nations based on their treatment of Israel, but he's not unfair. He's not unjust. He will also chastise his people Israel for their uh, idolatry, for turning away from him, for their rejection of him. He will chastise them for the purpose of drawing them to himself, Um, but he will also do that with the nations. And so, it's, it's important that we highlight that Israel is not exempt from these, uh, these oracles. So <clears throat> I'm just going to highlight these. Isaiah 13, of course, begins the famous oracle against Babylon. And this carries on in chapter 13 right into chapter 14. Isaiah 14 is the famous chapter, which is, you know, how you have fallen, O Lucifer, right there in the middle. So it begins with this oracle against the king of Babylon, and then it essentially bleeds right into speaking of judgment on Satan and on the Antichrist, who is Satan's human vessel in the earth. But it begins by using the historical character of the king of Babylon, and this this is a side issue, but there's a profound revelation concerning the Antichrist in this particular uh, prophecy. But nevertheless, so you begin with the oracle against Isaiah, And then moving forward, uh, at the conclusion of Isaiah 14, you have a prophecy, an oracle against the the Philistines, against Philistia. And then you have a prophecy in chapter 15 against Moab. And so again, a series of oracles and the context of them all, and this is the key, is the day of the Lord. I mean, when you read through all of these, you repeatedly have the statements, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord, and then in that day, in that day, in that day. And this statement in that day is a clear eschatological term that is used with reference to the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord, yes, there have been many sort of preliminary judgments down through history that you could say were days of the Lord, but the day of the Lord is the overwhelming focus. It's the overwhelming uh, burden of all of the biblical prophets. It's literally the yearning 
of the entire Bible as it points to the day when finally, after thousands of years, Jesus returns, Yeshua the Messiah comes back to the earth. He judges mankind. We will stand before him on that day. We will be held to account for the deeds done in this life, in this body, whether good or bad, and then he will restore and redeem all of creation. The righteous will be resurrected from the dead. And so this is the primary focus of the prophets, and we can't miss that, that the day of the Lord is not just a historical event or historical series of events. This is the culmination. This is the final conclusion of that which all the prophets are talking about. So that's the context of all of these oracles. And then right there in the middle of it, we have Isaiah 17. So let's go ahead now and plunge into the text. So Isaiah 17 says, the oracle concerning Damascus. Behold, Damascus is about to be removed from being a city and it will become a fallen ruin. So very clearly, the first verse, Damascus will cease. It will be removed from being a city and it will become a fallen ruin. So this is where a lot of people, they say, well, man, that sounds like a nuclear bomb. It just erases the city completely. And then it goes on and it says, the cities of Aror are forsaken. They will be for flocks to lie down in. In other words, they'll just be desolate pasture lands and there will be no one to frighten them. The, them being the sheep, being the goats and the sheep that will be pastured. No one will frighten them. It will be virtually desolate of people. Now, by the way, Aurora is a city that um, scholars have a difficult time identifying. Some say that it's a city that we don't know where it was that was in the, the vicinity of Damascus. Today, there is a city, uh, it, I mean, a more modern city, Aurora, which is in Jordan. It's actually on the west of the Dead Sea. So this would have been in um, the ancient kingdom of Moab, so central Jordan. Whether that's speaking of Jordan or not is difficult because Damascus and central Jordan, they're, they're fairly removed. Uh, on the other hand, it could be speaking of a massive, massive regional um, event, which not only causes Damascus to be uh, desolate, but also uh, many of the cities of Jordan as well. But again, we're not quite clear on that. It could just be a city that we just no longer know where it was, a suburb of Damascus in ancient times. So then in verse 3, Isaiah 17, verse 3, it goes on and it says, the fortified city will disappear from Ephraim. Now, this is key. And this is what I mean by students of prophecy often uh, taking a particular verse out of context and running with it and writing articles and making all sorts of predictions and so forth. So a lot of people read verse 1, Isaiah 17, verse 1, and they go, man, Damascus is going to be wiped out. This is huge. This is about to happen. Look at world events. The problem is when you just get to verse 3, I mean, just literally two verses later, it says the fortified cities of Ephraim will disappear. Well, what is Ephraim? Ephraim is a reference to northern Israel. Today, this would be modern Galilee, so to speak. But in Isaiah's day, you had the divided kingdoms. You had Israel in the north and Judah in the south. Isaiah was in Judah. Well, the northern kingdom of Israel had been sacked by the Assyrians, and most of the inhabitants had been taken away as captives. And so now he's speaking of not only is Damascus destroyed and desolate, but it says the fortified cities of northern Israel would be desolate as well. So here's the question. For those that are saying Damascus is about to any day now, imminently, this thing is about to happen, Damascus is about to be destroyed, why are they not also saying that northern Israel is about to be imminently destroyed? Because these things are integrally linked. They're all part of the same prophecy. They are all spoken of within the same context, within the same time period. So the events described by Isaiah in, in Isaiah 17, they don't concern Damascus alone. This is a massive, massive series of events which leads to not just Damascus, but northern Israel being desolate. And it goes on. Sovereignty from Damascus and the remnant of Aram. Now, notice it, it mentions the remnant. Okay, so the remnant is those that are left, the remainders of Damascus and Aram 
Aram Damascus was a kingdom to the north of Israel. So you had Judah and then Israel, and then to the north you had Aram Damascus. And it says, they will be like the glory of the sons of Israel, declares the Lord of hosts. Now, this is a statement which is in keeping with Isaiah's repeated themes of hope, that as he spoke judgment, he always left room for a remnant. And so essentially, and a lot of people miss this, what the Lord is saying is he saying Damascus will be like the glory of the sons of Israel. The point is this, is that when the northern tribes of Israel, most of them were carried away, there remained in the land a gleaning, a remnant, a small number. And he says it's going to be the same way with the Ram Damascus. So for those that say it's going to be utterly, completely desolate with no humans uh, inhabiting Damascus, that's not what the prophecy is actually saying. It's saying that it will virtually be... Uh, left desolate, but there does remain a remnant, not only in Damascus, but in Israel. And so we need to recognize and acknowledge Isaiah's point of hope. For this week's program, we are offering the Understanding the Times Prophecy DVD bundle. This important resource bundle includes the following four resources. Joel's newest teaching, Where is America in Bible Prophecy DVD? This dynamic two-session teaching DVD addresses all of the critical biblical passages that many have said point to the United States. Could the United States be Mystery Babylon as many students of prophecy now believe? Find out in the Where in the United States in Bible Prophecy DVD. Second, you will receive the What Comes Next in the Middle East DVD. This three-session teaching DVD examines the two critical passages of Daniel chapter 8 and Isaiah 19. Understanding what is happening right now in the Middle East and what may be next on the prophetic horizon. Third, you will receive the Understanding the Times DVD. This four-session DVD addresses the Gospel of the Kingdom, the Jewish Temple, and the Coming Covenant, and two sessions on identifying Mystery Babylon. And finally, as a bonus, you will receive Joel's documentary, End Times Eyewitness. This dynamic documentary film, shot on location throughout the Middle East, explores the unfolding signs of the return of Jesus. Together, all four items are only $55. To order, go to joelstrumpet.com and click on the Understanding the Times DVD bundle. So I've thrown up a map, by the way, just so you can get a feel for the kingdoms as they existed in Isaiah's day. In the north, you had the kingdom of Israel. Now, again, that had been taken out by the Assyrians. And then in the south, you had Judah, and that included, of course, Jerusalem. And so just north of the kingdom of Israel, you can see Aram Damascus. So this helps you just to get a, a feel for the landscape at that, at that present time that Isaiah was prophesying. And we need to have sort of this map in our mind to understand a little bit better what he was talking about. Because again, Isaiah was, was prophesying, and this is what the prophets do, and this is an important point. The prophets most often were speaking into and concerning events that concerned their immediate or their near future. So the, the audience that was listening to Isaiah, that these things were applicable. However, the prophets would prophesy through these events that were close to them, uh, that were close to them, but ultimately they are pointing to the day of the Lord. And so many times the prophets are prophesying through the events of their day or in their near future as they were pointing to the primary focus of all biblical prophecy, which is Jesus and that time period that surrounds his return and the establishment of his kingdom and his redemption of the earth. So we can't miss this. So, you know, understanding the kingdoms as they existed in Isaiah's day is critical because that helps us to understand uh, how the immediate audience of Isaiah would have understood them, and it helps us to understand what it's speaking of for our day as well. So then in verse 4 through 6, it says now, and this is the key, in that day, in that day. And this is where this statement is repeatedly used of the day of the Lord. And what does it say? It says, the glory of Jacob will fade. Jacob is Israel. In that day, the glory of Israel will fade. Now, again, you've got a lot of sort of prophecy folks, prophecy buffs, and they're almost rooting for Damascus to be destroyed. Like, yeah, this is about to be fulfilled. And I don't think it's because they, they, they're they callous to the inhabitants, to the peoples of Damascus. I think it's because they want to see prophecy fulfilled. So in their defense, uh, I don't think it's because they're just all a bunch of cold-hearted, you know, folks detached from reality, but sometimes 
It can certainly feel that way. And sometimes if we approach prophecy wrong, it can lead to that attitude. But you'll never hear these guys saying, yeah, in that day when Isaiah 17 is fulfilled, Israel is going to be diminished. The glory of Israel will be diminished because most of the pro-prophecy guys are pro-Israel. Okay, But notice what the prophecy says. And then it says the fatness of his flesh will become lean, that there is sort of wasting disease. There's this diminishing of Israel. It will even be like the reaper gathering the standing grain. When the standing grain is stiff and dry, that's when you come and you reap it. Okay, so the reaper comes through and then his arm harvests the ears. So the Lord, it's the heart, it's the Lord is the harvester ultimately. He harvests the grain, but then or it will be like one gleaning ears of grain. So after the harvest comes through, then the little bit that's fallen, then the gleaners come and the gleaners pick up the residue. And then there's only a little tiny bit sparsely left. And that's the picture that Isaiah is painting. He's going, after these things take place in that day, it's going to be like after the harvester comes through. And then even after that, the gleaner comes through and there's only just a very little bit left over. I mean, this is a, a bleak picture that he's painting. And then he says, yet gleanings will be left in it. So there again is Isaiah's note of hope. Gleanings will be left like the shaking of an olive tree, two or three olives at the topmost bough, four or five on the branches of a very fruitful tree, declares the Lord, the God of Israel. So again, the picture that's being painted here is, is of a regional desolation, Judah is going to be uh, you know, hammered by the Antichrist. Israel is going to be hammered by the Antichrist. And at the end of all these things, Damascus will be judged by the Lord as well. So I want to um, just begin wrapping this up again. Is this a prophecy that's about to be fulfilled? Yes. Yes. However, when we say about to be fulfilled, what we mean is in the greater context of the end times, the day of the Lord, it's not, Damascus is not about to be nuked. Damascus is not about to be wiped out. Could it become greatly diminished? Could war ravage uh, Damascus even more than it is now? Yes. However, the ultimate um, chronological time stamp on the prophecy of Isaiah 17 is at the end of the last days, at the end of the final seven years at the end of the tribulation, shortly before the return of Jesus. Damascus will be desolate, Israel will be desolate, and it speaks of it as a land that has already been harvested and gleaned, and just a few, a few olives, a few pieces of grain are left. Um, however, the Lord always reiterates and always promises there will be a remnant left in it. That speaks of Israel, and it also applies to Damascus and all of the surrounding nations. Believe me, the Lord has a remnant. The Lord right now is already saving a remnant out of these parts of the world. And so I hope that uh, I hope that this was helpful just to, again, contextualize one of the most critical prophecies that, that many people are looking at right now. We want to be responsible students of the words. We believe these things are about to be fulfilled, but we don't want to give ourselves over to every wind of doctrine, every idea that's just floating through. We want to be responsible students of the scriptures, and we don't want to give a bad name to the study of biblical prophecy by making false predictions and false starts and this sort of thing. These things are important. We need to approach the word of God with sobriety. So folks, that's all the time that we have for this week. Uh, I hope this was beneficial. I hope this uh, helped some of you that have been sort of wrestling through some of these prophecies. Uh, as always, I want to thank you so much for being with us. I'm Joel Richardson, and this is The Underground.